In this video tutorial, we will introduce the topic of organic chemistry. Specifically, we will look at isomerism and the need for structural formulae. All right, so early humans must have known that there were two types of materials in the world, those that can be eaten to keep you alive and those that cannot. You can eat roots and fruit, but you can't eat dirt itself. I mean, you can, but it won't really help you to stay alive. And so, by the early 19th century, scientists had labeled these two substances as being either organic or inorganic. It was thought that organic compounds were those derived from living organisms, hence the word organic, from organisms, and that these substances were unique in the sense that they contain an unmeasurable vital force, uh, the essence of life. Because scientists could not create life in the laboratory, they believed it impossible to create organic compounds containing this vital force. Conversely, inorganic compounds were those that were typically derived from minerals, but most importantly, they lacked this vital force. Now, this distinction between organic and inorganic compounds came to an end in 1828 when Friedrich Wohler synthesized urea, an organic compound found in urine. Now, keep in mind, synthesizing urea in and of itself, not a big deal. I mean, I synthesize urea at least six times a day, all right? But how Friedrich Wohler was able to synthesize urea through the decomposition of ammonium cyanate, an inorganic salt, this forced scientists to change their definitions of organic versus inorganic. Because now he was able to create an organic compound without an organism. He was able to create that organic compound through the use of inorganic substances. So today, when we talk about organic chemistry, we are essentially referring to the chemistry of the carbon atom. I mean, there are a few exceptions here and there, such as carbonates, carbon oxide, cyanides, and elemental carbon, but for the most part, the principal focus of organic chemistry is the carbon atom. All right, so why the carbon atom? What's so special about it? Well, first off, carbon has four bonding electrons. This allows it to bond to a variety of different elements, which allows it to produce a diverse set of molecules with unique characteristics and properties. Next, carbon can form strong single, double, and triple bonds, not just with other substances, but also with itself. This allows carbon to form long chains of atoms called polymers that are very stable, and very few elements can do this. Finally, carbon atoms can bond together to form a variety of geometric structures, such as straight chains, branch chains, rings, sheets, tubes, spheres. No other atom can do this. Well, at least not to the extent that carbon can. Now, a phrase you're going to hear me say over and over again throughout this unit is that function follows form, meaning that the structure or the way in which these atoms are connected together has a huge effect upon the function, the physical and chemical properties of the compound itself. Take a look at pentane, for example. It contains five carbons and 12 hydrogens. But I can draw a pentane like this with all five carbons in a single row, or I can draw a pentane like this with four carbons in a straight line, but one carbon branches off. In both cases, they are C5H12, but they've been assembled differently. Since they have a different form, they will have different functions. They'll have different physical and chemical properties. So when substances have the same chemical formula, in this case C5H12, but totally different shapes, we call them isomers. There are many different types of isomers, but the first one we're going to look at is called a structural isomer. I believe your textbook also calls them constitutional isomers. In any case, for now, just recognize that they have the same chemical formula, C5H12, but totally different structures, different ways in which the atoms are connected together. There's actually one more isomer for C5H12, and it looks like this. One, two, three, four, five carbons surrounded by 12 hydrogens. All right, so these are the three structural isomers for C5H12. And because there are so many different ways for you to assemble the five carbons and 12 hydrogens, Chemists use expanded molecular formulae to help us describe to the reader which version, which isomer of C5H12 we are referring to. All right, so it's no longer sufficient or adequate just to write down the chemical formula, C5H12. We have to be a little more explicit. Now, when it comes to drawing out these structural diagrams, there are three major methods. The first one I've shown you here is called the complete structural diagram. In this method, every single atom and how they're connected is shown. But as you can see, it gets quite tedious when you have to draw out so many hydrogens. So a more efficient method is called the condensed structural diagram. So let's draw this one over here using the condensed method. 
Rather than drawing every single hydrogen, we can just consolidate them all together. So in this case, this carbon has three hydrogens attached to it, so we wrote CH3. The next carbon has one hydrogen attached to it, so we wrote CH. Down here, it sprouts out a secondary branch, so we say CH3. This one has two hydrogens attached to it, CH2. And this one has three hydrogens attached to it, CH3. Now be aware, your textbook may redraw this as CH3 instead, but my personal preference is to write it as H3C to help the viewer visualize that the hydrogens are on this side of the carbon atom. So just be aware, whether you write it as H3C or CH3, it really doesn't matter. Now be aware, you may also see this version in your textbook, where instead of showing it branching off, they write it down as a bracket. By writing this inside a bracket, they're saying that it's branching off from this carbon. It's from the CH, a CH3 branches off in a separate direction. Now, some students may ask, sir, how do you know it's uh, branching off of this carbon? How do you know it's not branching off of this carbon instead? Well, that's because adding a CH3 over here would result in too many bonds on this carbon atom. So remember, carbon is only allowed to have four bonds attached to it, but if two of them are H's already, and the other two are connected to the other carbons over here, adding another CH3 would not be possible. So it can't be attached to this CH2, it must be attached to this CH over here. So let's put that back, and now we see where the CH3 properly belongs. Okay, so we've seen how the condensed structural diagram is able to simplify our drawings so that we don't have to show every single hydrogen in the compound. That definitely saves us a lot of time, but we can take it one step further with the line structural diagram. So let me draw this one out for you. Again, there are one, two, three, four, five carbons, so... With a line structural diagram, it would look something like this. One, two, three, four, five. Look at that. So much quicker and easier to draw out than the condensed or the complete structural diagram. So with this method, every vertice or endpoint represents a carbon atom that has been filled to capacity, or we say saturated, with hydrogen atoms unless otherwise stated. So remember, carbon can form four chemical bonds. Over here, we see one chemical bond that is explicitly shown. Since we don't see anything else attached to it, we can make the assumption that the remaining bonds are connected to hydrogens. So this carbon atom over here would have three hydrogens attached to it. Now this carbon has two bonds that are explicitly shown, and so the remaining ones that are not shown must be filled with hydrogens. So this carbon would have two hydrogens attached to it. The same goes for this carbon and this carbon while this last one would be similar to the first with three hydrogens that are not shown. Alright, so line structural diagrams are a lot easier to draw out because we don't have to draw in the individual hydrogens. Instead, the reader can guess how many hydrogens are attached just by looking at how many bonds are explicitly being shown and then assuming that the remaining unshown bonds are filled or saturated, if you will, with hydrogen atoms. Now, keep in mind, we can only assume that they are carbon atoms unless otherwise stated. So in this case, this endpoint over here, it's not a carbon atom. Instead, it's a bromine atom. Since bromine can only form one chemical bond, there is no room to bond any more hydrogens around this one. So there's no hydrogens around this point. But this carbon atom, however, has three explicit bonds, uh, two blue, one red. So the remaining one must be a hydrogen. So I can assume that there is one hydrogen atom attached to this carbon. Now if I want to draw a double bond, it would look something like this. So this carbon over here with two bonds explicitly shown would have two hydrogens attached to it. While this one with three bonds explicitly shown, two blues and one purple, would only have room for one hydrogen attached to it. Alright, so there's no need to draw in the hydrogens because the reader can predict how many are attached to it based on the number of bonds you see explicitly being drawn in. Now, if you want to draw a triple bond, it should look something like this, with one hydrogen attached to this carbon atom and zero hydrogens attached to this carbon atom. Alright, so I'd like you to press pause and try to draw this isomer of pentane using the line diagram method. When you're ready, press play and we will take it up. And hopefully you drew something like this. So this carbon atom already has four bonds explicitly drawn, so there's no room for any hydrogens. So this one has zero hydrogens, exactly as we predict over here. Meanwhile, each of these carbons on the exterior 
have one bond drawn explicitly, so there's room for three more hydrogens here, 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 and here, as we see in our diagram above. Now, on a test, you can draw any method you'd like, complete, condensed, or line. However, uh, if you try to do a complete diagram, chances are you will run out of time. You won't be able to finish the test on time. That being said, my tests will only have line diagrams on it because I'm not going to waste my time trying to draw every single one of these structures and every single one of these atoms. It's much easier for me to draw line structures on a test than it would be to draw a complete or condensed. So you might not have to uh, draw a line diagram yourself, but you must be able to at least interpret a line diagram because that's all that's going to be given to you on a test. Now one more thing I'd like to add when you're drawing line structural diagrams is that you need to be careful how you count them. So let's take the example of C6H14. You should draw it like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so six endpoints or vertices to represent carbon atoms. A common mistake I'll see students make is when they draw it like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. You saw me count to six, but I actually drew seven vertices and endpoints. Let's watch that again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Did you catch my mistake? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, even though I counted six, because I wasn't counting vertices or endpoints. I was counting lines. The moment I counted one, that wasn't one. That's already two endpoints. So you have to be careful. Don't count lines. Don't just go one, because that's actually two. You have to go one, two three, four, five, six. As soon as you put the pencil to the paper, that's already a one. So that is a common mistake I see students make. Uh, another one that I've only seen happen once, thankfully, and, but hopefully you won't repeat this one. It went like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that is definitely not hexane. As far as I'm concerned, that's only two carbons, not six. So please make your end, uh, vertices and endpoints explicit or obvious. I'm not going to try and guess where you started and stopped. Oh, and please try not to make some weird interpretive art piece. Here's the deal I'm going to make with you. If you make it easy for me to mark, I'm going to make it easy for you to get marks. You make it difficult for me to mark, well, you can guess what the end result of that will be. Okay, let's take a look at our next question. Hexane C6H14 has five structural isomers. We've already drawn the first structural isomer. What I want you to do now is try to find the other four structural isomers that I have not drawn. Now, be careful when it comes to drawing these structural isomers. Just because something looks different doesn't mean it is different. So for instance, if I took hexane over here, and then I just flip this upside down, it's still the same molecule. It may look different, but it's the same thing. All we are doing is just looking at the same molecule from a different perspective. That's it. It's still the same molecule itself. So you haven't made anything brand new. So once again, these two diagrams are just mirror images along the horizontal axis. They are the same molecule. They're not different. Now, what if I took the carbon atom and I brought it from down here and moved it up here instead? So it's pointing up instead of down. Well, once again, it changes nothing. It looks different, but it's still the same molecule. If you recall, single bonds are comprised of sigma bonds. So that's where the electron clouds overlap each other in a head-to-head -head manner. This in turn allows them to rotate freely along this axis, allowing for both the up and down pointing conformations to both exist. So drawing the carbon atom pointing up or pointing down makes no difference. It's still the same molecule. Alrighty, so even if I did something crazy like this, it's still the same molecule. Uh, even if I move it over here like this, it's still the same molecule. The key is I have to physically remove a carbon atom, so like this over here, delete that, and add it back in on a different site. Now I've created something brand new. Now this is a different isomer for C6H14. But once again, since the single bond is allowed to freely rotate, having it point up versus pointing down makes no difference. It's still the same compound. All right, so just moving the carbon into a different orientation so it's pointing in a different direction doesn't change the molecular structure, doesn't make it a new isomer, it's not a new compound, but you have to physically take the carbon atom and place it in a different location. Now you've got a new isomer, a new structural isomer. So let's press pause, try and draw the remaining four structural isomers for hexane C6H14. When you're ready, press play and we will take it up together. 
And here we have the five structural isomers for C6H14. Each one of them is a unique structure. You can't just move one of the carbon atoms and point it in a different direction in order to achieve one of these other shapes. You actually have to remove the carbon atom and attach it in a different location to achieve each of these structures over here. So for instance, this one over here, you can't just take this carbon and place it over here because all you've done is just rotate it on this side. So now it's pointing up over here instead. Right? So it's the same chemical compound. You're just rotating it or viewing it from a different perspective. Same chemical compound. Now, some of you may have tried to draw a ring structure like this. And yes, you do have six carbons, but you don't have 14 hydrogens here. There are only 12 hydrogens in this ring structure, whereas every single one of these contains 14 hydrogens. All right, so just be careful when drawing out these structural isomers. Make sure you have the right number of atoms, C6H14, so this one would not work out. But also make sure you're not just drawing the same structure in a slightly different way, where even though it looks different, it is not different.